Jesus told me so. There's something to live for. Okay, cut. Take 31. So is that enough now? Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today, we're counting down our picks for the documentaries that made us laugh, along with helping us learn something new. The joke sucks. You suck for having the idea of putting this on a documentary. Number 10. Anvil, the story of Anvil. Have you ever had a day where everything went wrong? Now imagine if a whole tour went the same way. The band has been around so long, it's not like a band that just got reunited. or in shape. Anvil is a band from the 1980s that struggled to reach the same success as their contemporaries. Why? Why did they just fall off the radar? I really have no idea. You have to be the right place at the right time. Their doc recorded their attempts at re-entering the mainstream via a series of shows in Europe. Things always seemed to go wrong at the last second, from missing their transfers to not being paid after shows. Despite the misfortune, the members maintain a positive attitude about their careers. A major label should put this out because it's not justice to have something that sounds this good to go out on anything less than that. Their self-deprecating jokes about their lack of recognition added a layer of humorous self-awareness. He's going to look at it, he goes, let me see, what am I looking at? Okay, these guys are in their 50s, and he's got another band that's here, these guys are in their 20s. Hmm. It offered a realistic view of making it in the music industry while still managing to be funny, which is definitely a hard line to walk. Number 9. Exit Through the Gift Shop There is a guy here, a guy there. And they said, you are in big, big, big trouble. Street art has been on the rise in recent years, with many people utilizing the form. This hybrid form of graffiti was driven by a new generation using stickers, stencils, posters, and sculptures to make their mark by any means necessary. The most well-known of the early 21st century is arguably Banksy, an anonymous creator with a penchant for pranking his audience. Exit through the gift shop had the same effect. People couldn't tell if it was real or not. Street art has a short lifespan, so it needed documenting. You know, we all needed someone who knew how to use a camera. While Banksy was supposed to be the original topic, that changed early on when he noticed how peculiar filmmaker Thierry Guetta was, and how most of his original footage was unusable. This led the artist to flip the script and take over the project, which was now about the former director becoming a successful artist himself. So this is gonna be like a jail. He's gonna have bar here. Guetta's earnest eccentricity, combined with the expert's commentary, morphed it from a standard documentary to a laugh riot. It. They say that art is dead, but sweetie, it's all around us. Great. Bravo. Number 8. Swimming to Cambodia If a performer is worth their salt, then they should be able to entertain, no matter the circumstances. Spalding Gray proved just how talented he was when he filmed Swimming to Cambodia. And it was the first day off in a long time, and the Thai waiters are running and smiling and bringing us more cluster, cluster, cluster beer. It's centered around a simple concept, his experiences working in another continent. The twist? It was all one long monologue. 90% of the land was owned by the people. It was earth, it was dirt, but it was theirs and it was good. And, and they knew how to have a good time. While there was a risk of losing people's attention, he kept them entranced. Each story is layered with chaos that ramps up with each sentence, until the viewer is at the edge of their seat waiting for the final punchline. Number eight. And number eight stands up and you can tell immediately by the expression on her face it's not going to be as great as you fantasize because among other things you've interrupted her TV show. From hallucinating sharks to his feelings on patriotism, everything he said was dripping in hilarity. It was a new use of the form that solidified Gray's status as a legendary performer. This is it. This is a mission. It's not just the film that I was here for. It's all coming together now. Number seven. Not quite Hollywood. The wild, untold story of Ozploitation. Exploitation films were a niche subgenre that took off throughout the 1960s to the 80s, with many taking place in Australia. Most of the Australian genre films were actually released 
in America, all right, through exploitation houses and stuff. And it was actually coinciding with the whole big Australian boom. Big Many critics and viewers found them to be overly gratuitous when it came to sex and violence and many have been excluded from the continent's cultural history. Australians at the time didn't want to see it as Australian. People walked away saying, that's not us, we don't behave like that. This documentary set out to give those Ozploitation projects their flowers. The director crafted a love letter to the genre, highlighting movies that he felt were given a disservice. The crocodile was supposed to move at a reasonable clip. Well, I suppose that might have depended a little bit on what your definition of a reasonable clip was. The result was an informative yet highly entertaining piece showing some of Australia's raunchiest films. The scenes they showed were hilariously campy, and the interviews from acclaimed directors like Quentin Tarantino only added to the entertainment value. And then I showed it to Uma, and she goes, I'm not going to do that. And I go, why? And she goes, you wouldn't have your eyes open like that if you were in a coma. That's not realistic. I go, Actually, I never thought, was it realistic or not? It's just Patrick did it, all right? It was the perfect way to learn more about a nearly forgotten genre. We didn't really know what we were doing. We just kind of leapt into it and just tried to shoot the living crap out of it. And some of it was pretty good. Number six, Slasher. What happens when you get excited? Sometimes you let your guard down about your shopping mode. You let your guard down, you get sucked in. When seeing the title, you may think it's about a serial killer. But this man was more fond of slashing prices than people. People say, what's a good deal on a car? What's a good... Whatever you think is a good deal. What is a good deal? I don't know. Is it in your budget? Do you like the vehicle? Are you happy? That's a good deal. Michael Bennett was a used car salesman with a love for the game. He often employed a tactic where he would advertise cars at an extremely low price for a limited time. His energy on screen is matched only by his excitement for sales. How did you plan on buying a car today? Do you got a bag full of money? Do you have a co-signer? If you get some right answers, maybe we can turn that red tag into a blue tag. His increasingly bananas sales ideas combined with his never-ending passion results in a hilarious watch. When I come up, I want you guys to go, what do I got to do? What do I, I'm going to say, what do I got to do? And you're going to go, what? What do I got to do with this car, folks? Slash it. Slash it. Him sprinting around to slash prices on the spot as customers incessantly honk is so chaotic that it seems scripted. And yet, it's all real. Come on, slash it. Take off $4,500. Take it from $15,800. Take off another $500. Take it down to $12,900, baby. It showed an inside look not only at the industry, but those who participated in it. Number five, shut up, little man. Sometimes the best documentary subjects are the ones who don't realize they're being recorded. Audio verite is audio that is true, that's real audio, that's oftentimes uh, recorded surreptitiously. After two friends moved into an apartment together, they soon realized that their neighbors had two favorite activities, imbibing and arguing loudly. I'm laying in bed and I hear, shut up little man, I'm oh, oh, not again. And then I heard the other voice. They recorded these moments and released them as audio clips before eventually adapting them to film format. First of all, I thought it was this one lunatic like talking to himself in the room, right? Then I understood, oh, there's two dudes in there and they're fighting. The footage included compilations of the incidents, which were sometimes exacerbated by the ones recording. Their biting insults and explosive arguments made for fantastic entertainment. They seemed to come up with the most creative ways of demeaning each other, with plenty of swearing peppered in. However, despite their tumultuous fights, they reportedly had a deep friendship. Giggle, you? Giggle, giggle, dirty little man. You always giggle falsely. It showcased how layered people are and how they can maintain relationships despite being seemingly antagonistic. Number four, tabloid. There's always two sides to every story. It was like he had a personality alteration. Kirk number one and Kirk number two. Kirk number one was the man I fell in love with. Kirk number two was cult Kirk. In this intense historical documentary, director Errol Morris set out to explain one of the most outrageous cases in UK history, centered around a troubled young woman and her obsession with her Mormon lover. She was in her late 20s, had an outstanding figure, had a southern accent, long blonde hair. There are plenty of bizarre twists, 
from kidnapping to supposed cult activity. Her and her ex have always had conflicting accounts on what truly happened, which fueled the tabloid-heavy culture at the time, and is obviously not a joking matter. It had religion, it had a beauty queen, kidnap at gunpoint. The movie sets out to paint the events in an unbiased light, while highlighting how the media response caused people to not see her alleged crimes as serious. It wasn't clear, really, what Keith May's motive was, except that he adored Joyce. However, the events and people involved can seem so out there at times that it may be difficult not to laugh as you try to piece together what truly occurred. Number 3. Winnebago Man This doc asks one important question. What happens to those who become internet famous? In Winnebago Man, that question is answered tenfold. Oh, I've seen this like hundreds of times, and this guy's, I mean, this guy's like a legend, basically. The viral source in question is Jack Rebney, a former journalist and spokesman for RVs, who became known after a series of expletive ridden commercial outtakes were released on VHS and YouTube. The Winnebago Concepts and Engineering Departments have developed a multifunctional bathroom. Privacy, I don't even know what the f I'm reading. The documentary was focused around the director desperately trying to find Rebney and get his side of the story. I had no idea that anybody had taken those outtakes and put them together. Ultimately, one of my dear friends called and he said, have you pulled yourself up on the internet? The clips of his freakout combined with the real-life cantankerous personality of Jack added a funny yet endearing quality to the film. Whomever is, might possibly watch this uh, documentary that you're making, I'd like to have them say to themselves, well, gee, I never thought about that. Beyond the comedy, Winnebago Man also made important points about how highlighting someone's worst day can often have long-term consequences, something that we're still learning to this day. Not even funny anymore. You're paying the price for our collective, you know, cultural guilt at having humiliated this person. Number two, the aristocrats. Everybody starts people. And one of them vomited <laughs> off, and that made everybody else sick. Throughout history, jokes have been repeated and passed down to new generations. One has survived due to its explicit nature. Chevy Chase supposedly used to have parties, and the criteria was you had the mom, the dad, the son, the daughter, and a dog. And you had to talk with some combination of that without repeating yourself. The basic setup is that a family is trying to get picked for a show, and when asked for their talent, they either perform or describe a series of vulgar and usually illegal activities as part of their act. My wife and I come out on stage. I've taken a lot of uh, medicine prior to the appearance, and I've eaten a lot of the uh, Cabbages. Then, when asked for their act's name, they simply say they're the aristocrats. What do you call the act? The aristocrats. This long-running bit was the theme of a doc featuring comedians, from Phyllis Diller to Bob Saget. Mother had a big boil on her back. That popped. <laughs> Each comic told their variation of the bit, explaining its contribution to the art form as a whole, while also showcasing their own unique comedic styles. The result is a side-splitting yet genuinely enlightening piece about one of the most long-standing quips in history. You could see the guys up on the dais were looking at each other and they had this look of familiarity in their eyes. They were all sort of saying, where is he going to take this thing? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. American Movie Movie making isn't an easy process, but the hard work is usually hidden behind the shiny final product. Why the hell are we here? We're working on Northwestern, the third draft. I've got to get it so it's not embarrassing to give out. Making films independently can be even harder, as revealed in 1999's American Movie. Man. And you didn't, oh, you did follow me. Yeah. The footage follows director Mark Borchardt as he attempts to make a movie while navigating constant issues, such as a lovable yet inept crew and a lack of funds. In another time, uh, we dragged Mark like head first through a swamp like 25 times. The true heart and humor comes from this crew as they try to help him, from his senile yet loaded uncle to his loyal best friend. It's all right. 
uh, something to live for. Jesus told me so. Okay, great, Bill, but we gotta, we have to have fluidity in there. It's all right, it's okay. Uh, Despite the setbacks, they were able to finish the short film, even if it was just minutes before the premiere. It showed a raw yet hilarious representation of how much work, skill, and dedication it takes to fully commit to the creative process. Which documentary made you laugh the hardest? Let us know in the comments. I ain't gonna do this anymore. That's all for me. Goodbye. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from Watch Mojo and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.